everyone. I'm back again with my friend Molly, waving hi from both of us, and we're going to talk about our next lesson for American Girl History class. Hope you're all doing well. Hope you're healthy, washing your hands a lot, keeping your distance from other people outside your family, all those good things. Um, we're going to talk some today about another topic about World War II and Molly's time. So I'm going to set Molly down so she can listen just like you all. Now, as you recall, last week we talked about some things about the war that started with an R. Rationing, recycling, and raids, which was really talking about the blackout practices, um, so of, which were also, also referred to as air raids. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up, and I hope you remember all of those things, and I hope that you were able to practice a blackout drill. Um, if you did, and you want to share your experience with me, have your mom send me a text or an email, and I'd be happy to learn about how that all went. I know when we used to do it in class, when we were able to meet, in, and in the past, uh, girls always had fun doing that. So um, it's just something to think about. Now, furthermore, I want to mention when I talked about rationing last time, I talked about a lot of different foods that were rationed. Um, and other items. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, or I learned more about since then, I should say, um, is that another thing that they collected besides scrap metal, and I mentioned boys and girls walking around town you know, pulling their wagons and loading them up with scrap metal for the war, um, they also collected paper. Um, paper was very short. Uh, they had a shortage of it back then. And one of the reasons is paper is made out of what? Do you know? Trees. And they had a shortage of lumberjacks. Lumberjacks are the men that chop down the trees, or better yet, they have special saws that they move around, or power saws. And uh, those trees are heavy, and you, they need strong men to do that job. And a lot of those men had gone where? Overseas to serve in the war, or in some war capacity. So they didn't have as much paper because they didn't have as many trees available to do that hard job. Um, they also were making more products with papers and cardboard because they were saving the metal as much as they could for war supplies. So some products that you normally would buy in a tin container were now in a paper container. So they really encourage you to recycle back then and to save those paper products and old magazines and old newspapers and whatever, boxes and then they would use them again for other kinds of paper. And there was even some things they could do with it to help with the war effort too, with um, some weapons. So paper was a big thing to collect and the kids could go door to door saying, do you have any old magazines or newspapers or you know whatever, so we can donate it to the war effort. And another thing that I didn't mention that was not a food item either was gas. Gas was something that they rationed now. The difference with gas is that they didn't ration it because they didn't have enough gas, because they did have enough gas in America. That wasn't a problem. What they had a shortage of was rubber, and I mentioned last week that that's something that they collected and tried to gather for the war. Well, what does a car drive on? Wheels, right? And they wanted to have more rubber available because we didn't have enough here in America. Uh, so they said, don't drive your car as much. Stay home. Just go locally. Go If you have to go somewhere, what's another way you could get there? By your feet, right? Walking on your, well, it's not my feet, but you know what I mean. I'm simulating it. <laughs> Use your feet <laughs> and walk or your bike or maybe even your roller skates or roller blades or something to get there, you know, without using a car. And just like now, when we're told to social distance and some of the other things that we're told to do. Some people are doing very good with it. I'm sure you are, with just staying with your families. But some people have been still getting together in groups. We're down in Florida. I've heard of people getting together with a big group on a beach and things like that. And that's not what we're supposed to do. Well, in that time, too, there were some people that said, we want to do all we can to help with the war. And they were good about it. But apparently, there were some that still were driving too far. So they decided they would make the gas not as available for them. So in other words, 
you could only get a tiny amount of gas each week. So you couldn't go anywhere. If you don't have gas in your car, your car's not going to move. So there was five different kinds of rationing tickets for gas. One was an A ticket, the letter A, and that was for just the ordinary citizens of the community that didn't have a lot of driving to do. They could stay mostly at home or get around, like I said, by walking or biking or whatever. They would be allowed three gallons of gas a week. Now I know you girls aren't driving yet and it'll be a while, but that's not a lot of gas. But the A coupons got three gallons a week. The people with a B coupon were ones that would be uh, men and women that were out and about more, like a, a traveling salesman that was just driving around in the community that he lived in, um, or some factory workers, and the factory wasn't too far that they could drive to and from each day. They would get the B ticket and they would be allowed <clears throat> eight gallons of, oops, sorry, I can't count today, eight gallons of gas a week, which isn't a whole lot more, but it gave them a little bit more freedom to travel to their jobs. The third one was the C coupons, and C coupons were for um, people that were essential for the war effort, workers for the war effort, and also doctors, um, uh, policemen, you know, people like that that had to get around, that had really important jobs uh, mailmen, things like that. Now, my dad has coupons that I, like I told you last week, could not find, and I believe his are a C. I'm going to tell you a little bit more later about his job during the war, but he had to stay home and help in his important job at home, and apparently he needed uh, freedom to be able to drive back and forth more often, and he had a little bit more freedom with a C coupon, because those are for drivers, people that drove their car ne by necessity, to a lot of different places. And then the fourth coupon was a T coupon, and that was for truck drivers. And you know truck drivers, they need a lot more gas to drive a big truck. And then there was an X uh, coupon, and that was more for politicians and important people. And I'm not sure all who was included in that, but those are important people that had to get around and had to travel longer distances. The last three, the C coupon, the T, the truck, and the X for the important politicians, etc., didn't have a limit on gas. They could get as much as needed. But again, don't go crazy and buy too much. So I wanted to mention that just because I thought that was an interesting thing to realize how they limited people from getting around back then. It was with gas rationing. Now, we are talking about gas rationing. We're talking about the lack of workers and needing paper um, from trees and all those things. That brings me to the fact that during the war, uh, there were jobs that were left, um, that were important and, and were here at home, but there were also jobs that were now left or neglected because where were most of the men going, right? They were going into the military. A huge majority of the men and the brothers, sons, fathers, uncles, etc., like I mentioned before, were going overseas, or training to go overseas, or doing some important war work here at home. Well, if someone leaves a job, then there's a big opening and we need help. And we did need a lot of help back then. And who did they turn to? Well, the theme of this week's lesson is women. They turned to the women. Now that seems pretty logical. If the men are gone, the women are gonna help out more. But this came at a time in history when women were, cons were uh, considered uh, the keepers of the home. You know, they wanted a woman to be uh, feminine, which is nothing wrong with that, but um, they didn't think she should be doing anything other than staying home, raising the children if they, the family has children, taking care of her husband if she's married, keeping the house clean, doing all those kinds of things that your moms probably do but they didn't want them to have anything else to do outside of the home. Now, there were some women that worked out of the home. That's, I'm not saying there weren't any, but it was a smaller number. And especially, it was more common with single women before they got married, might have a job. Well, here we are in a war crisis and we need women. And so they started advertising uh, uh, the military, the factories, the different places started saying, we need you. <laughs> And they had all kinds of posters. I have a bunch of things to show you, but 
this whoops down here it says victory weights on your fingers keep them flying miss usa and it's an advertisement for this woman to use her typewriting skills to work at an office uh an office job now an office job was something women did do back then but we needed more now because some of the men that did those jobs needed to go overseas and so the whole idea is you know keep them flying um there were other posters that said things like you know we're working hard to bring them home because the goal was let's get this war over and get our loved ones our men home and people wanted to do anything to get that done and so there were a lot of women that volunteered to help with the war effort they couldn't do much they're not going to be overseas fighting that wasn't allowed for women to do that and they were needed at home to take care of their families etc but what could they do at home they could help out well there was a Whoop, I just dropped something. There was a ton of jobs to do at home. One of the big jobs that was really needed back then was um, factories. Factories made uh, all kinds of equipment and they were needed. Um, a lot of the jobs in the factories were jobs that only men had had. Never before had a woman ever done this job. Jobs where they got really dirty, where they had to use heavy tools and you know, screw things, hammer things, and weld things. If you don't know what welding is, that's like, uh, like if you have two pieces of metal and you want to mesh them together, you're not gonna use a sewing needle and thread, of course, to put metal together, it's not cloth, but you can use a welder, which is a hot tool. Uh, you wear a protective mask over your face because it's very dangerous and it's hot, this is hot like almost like a gun with a with a stick on it that gets hot it's hard to explain but if you saw a picture you'd understand and it melts the two metal pieces together there's often sparks flying and so forth and it's a dangerous job but you need you learn the safety rules and you learn how to do it and some women were very good at it in fact many of the women did better at some jobs than the men had interestingly enough but it took the men a while to get used to those women there's some men that did not go overseas to serve or were needed at home for various reasons. And at first they resented those women. You know, I'm the head of this family, I'm gonna work, my wife shouldn't have to work, or those women don't know what they're doing. How can we trust them with our jobs? They're just gonna make a mistake, they're gonna hurt themselves or, or hurt our equipment or something like that, you know? And those are the kind of things you heard. But it wasn't long before the men realized that these women were pretty sharp, they were, one important thing is they were willing. They wanted to do their best to help out and they were willing to put their best foot forward, which means to work their hardest to do their best job. The other thing is they were united in the cause to serve our country. And as I mentioned before, you'll hear me say this more than once, everything was for the war effort. For the war effort is a phrase so much used by everyone because we want to get this war fought and we wanted to get it over with. Um, so these women went in their dresses. Back then women mostly wore dresses, slacks, which is what they were called, pants, or trousers was another name for pants, were just becoming um, a little more acceptable. But that was only for if you were at home. If you were gonna go out in public or do something, you would wear a dress. Because women just mostly wore dress and a little heel on their shoe and um, so forth, but, um, and often a hat on their head. But back then, uh, those jobs in the factories required wearing pants for safety, because, and also because they were getting very dirty, they wanted to be covered. So they would wear a uniform that was, um, I have a picture somewhere, I'll find it, that was from head to toe, well, pretty much, and um, here it is. I got all my things laid here to find, just like I do in a class. Here's a lady with a typical like overall or jumpsuit on. Um, you can see better. Got a shirt, a blouse underneath, but then this whole get up here is like the, like one big pair. They pulled it up. Her hair was pulled away from her face, and many of them wore like a kerchief or a net or something on their hair to keep it away from their face because they didn't want it to get caught in any machinery or any you know, equipment that was dangerous or could cause a fire or something like that. Um, so anyway, they did that 
to be safe. So this is the women going in, applying for these jobs, filling out the forms, learning the safety rules, and then being put to work. And amazingly, they, they just uh, really went to work. Six million women were employed during the war. And uh, it's amazing the the workforce was, I don't remember the exact percentage, but it was very low. And then it went to, um, to like 37% of the women, of the workforce were women by the end of the war. So things really changed. Um, they did all kinds of jobs, like I mentioned, um, riveting and, and all these different things. Uh, uh, um, welding, I said. I didn't say riveting. That's like putting uh, some screws in or uh, so, I mean, to hold something together. That's another term, riveter, um, that they did. But they worked in factories. And the other thing I want you to know about is that the factories back then, uh, a lot of them changed during the war. Maybe before the war, like a Ford uh, motor company that made cars changed to making engines for uh, war equipment. So the engines for tanks or, or jeeps or some other kind of vehicle that they needed in the war. Um, maybe they'd start making airplanes instead. Um, a ship factory that would be located on the ocean where they'd make big ships like along the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean or by the Great Lakes like Lake Michigan is the one closest to us, Lake Michigan. I didn't say that very clearly. Um, there would be factories there to make ships, shipyards, and now we didn't need ships just for transporting supplies, that's important, or for transporting people. We need them for our military, either for the military, for the men to use in fighting and the men to use for you know, getting the supplies they needed for the war. So now the ships factories were turned into war ship factories. And again, women were working there. Very many women worked there, uh, amazingly, a num large number. And, uh, it's just really interesting um, to read about them and what they did and the sacrifices that they made. Now, a question you might have about these women going to work is, okay, they were supposed to be at home taking care of their children, the ones that had children, of course. What did they do if their husband was serving overseas and they were watching their children at home and keeping them fed and comfortable and cared for? Now they have to go to work. Well, another reason they went to work is to earn some money, but also to help with the war effort. Well, they have to go to work. How are they going to do that? They can't leave their little children at home alone, and uh, that would not be safe, right? Now, if they had an older brother or sister that was like high school, teenager age, they could watch their children, uh, their brothers and sisters. Uh, maybe their brothers and sisters were in school. Not as many people homeschooled back then. They could, uh, after school, be in charge and you know make sure everything was cared for. But that wasn't always available, and that wasn't always the situation that worked out. So what they would do um, is help each other. Uh, they did start more daycare centers back then. I read, I just saw that earlier today. I was reading about um, you know, more opportunities, places where you could bring your children and have them cared for and get a meal and so forth while you were at work. But also families helped each other. This was a time of pitching in working together as a team, okay? I have a lot of wonderful friends that I've met at my job working with older, elderly people at the home I cared for them in. And one of my friends named Betty told me that during the war, she had a job, and I believe it was at a factory. I cannot remember which kind of factory, but that's not important. I wanted to say that she worked at this job during the day, and her sister and her family lived with her too because their husbands were overseas. So she took care of the children, or she went to work in the daytime, like say maybe eight to five or something like that at this plant, this factory, and her sister watched her kids and her own children. Then Betty came home from work and her sister got ready and went to work and Betty watched the children. So they had kind of a, a you know, a teamwork <laughs> co-op of, of the two of them where they took turns watching the kids so that the other one could go to work. That could also be done with a neighbor or grandparents or, you know, whatever worked out. Everybody was in this together and they wanted to make it work. So you did what you had to do. Um, you could not take your children to work. That would be dangerous. So you had to find a way to make do. Now, when we're talking about the factories changing from making one product to making another product during the war, I wanted to mention, I think some of you have been to O'Hare Airport before. 
it's the biggest one of the biggest airports in the world it used to be the busiest it isn't anymore but it's still one of the top busiest it's a huge huge airport in Chicago um, during the war it was not there it was called Douglas manufacturing plant and it had been a community called Orchard Place where a lot of people lived um, in fact a lot of them were German immigrants people that came over from Germany and came became you know Americans and lived in our country and at some point, they made it into this air, this uh, manufacturing plant that made airplanes. I have a picture of some ladies making airplanes. It's not particularly from that plant, but it's very, very similar. And this is a picture of these ladies. I don't know if you can see this picture, but those cone, these little cone-looking things. And there's ladies by each one. There's no men in this picture. There's ladies working at every single station there. These are the noses or the very front tip of a plane or a bomber plane. And they're working on them. Before they're finished, they have an important part that they're putting on. Everybody had an important job and you had to be good at it and make sure you did it right because if you did something wrong, you know, like a part of the airplane, was, a screw was loose or, uh, you know, other jobs they had were like uh, scientists working on supplies and and uh, ammunition, war supplies and things. And if you got one chemical wrong in your mixture, that can make a big difference. Everybody had to be very careful and be precise. And so this was a job that some women had, uh, is working there. And that's what this plant, which uh, was called Douglas Manufacturing Plant, was in Chicago. And the reason was is because there were a lot of railroads nearby that could take the, you know, could help with supplies. It was also a place that was far, it's kind of in the middle of our country. It's not near the, the oceans, and so it was a safer place to um, have a plant and, and be away from danger. And another thing was is uh, Chicago was very close by, and it was the second largest city in our whole country of, in the U.S., so that was a good um, link for it, too. So I do also have another friend that I worked with at my houses, an older woman that was born in the 30s named Sue, her mom worked there during the war, and she told me how she remembers that her older brother took care of her at home because he was about 10 years older while her mom went to work there during the war. Later on, after the war was over, a few years later, down the roadways, it became a, a, a beginning of an airport that over time grew to become the, the huge airport it is today, O'Hare. So there's a lot of interesting connections in the Chicago area. My dad worked for a company that was needed during the war, and that's why he got what they call a deferment. They, he was willing to serve, but they said, no, we need you here. And he was a foreman, or he was in charge of a group of men, and probably some women during the war, um, that worked on important equipment that was helpful uh, for airplanes in the war, for uh, flyers that were involved in the war. And so he was needed, and um, so he didn't have to go overseas. Uh, he had an important job here at home for the war. So there was just so many things going on at that time and so many jobs that uh, some men stayed home to do because they needed to, but women could take on other jobs that they had never done before. And they were freeing up, the, the other theme was, were freeing up the men so they could go overseas. So may, some of the desk jobs that men had, like uh, typing and phone calls and things like that, women could do some of that work so that they could enlist and go overseas to serve. So there were many ways where the women could fit in and do their share to help. Um, there was one other thing I was going to show you that this list um, they have right next to that picture I showed you of the ladies working at the air, air, uh, airplane manufacturing company. Uh, there's, whoops, here it is on this side. I'm going to read you this list. This is like a typical list um, for a woman because their days were busy. Just like I said, my friend Betty worked all day, came home and took care of the kids, had to get some sleep and get up the next morning bright and early and go to work again. And it was hard work. Here's a typical schedule from another woman. And a lot of these women worked the night shift because they needed help at nights too at these factories. They worked 24 hours. And the night shift wasn't the most popular shift, but sometimes it was the best because then someone could watch your children while they were sleeping and you could go to work. Here's the schedule, 7 a.m., leave 
the factory. This is a woman that worked nighttime. So she worked until 7 in the morning. She worked all night, left at 7. 8 a.m., send children to school. So she got home in time to relieve whoever was watching her children and send them to school. At 8.30, she went to the grocery store and did some shopping. At 10, she went to bed. She got a little sleep in, and then at 11.30, the children were home from school to have lunch. A lot of children came home for lunch in those days. And so she made lunch for the children, sent them back to school. She went back to bed at 12.30, like an hour later. At 3 o'clock, after about two and a half hours of sleep, the children were home from school. So she had to get up again. She couldn't stay in bed. From 3 to 7, she did the laundry. She cleaned the house. She cooked the dinner. At 7, she went back to bed again and had a little bit of sleep while the kids were going to bed or in bed. And then at 10, she left for work. Now that schedule makes me tired. And if you were doing it every day, oh my goodness, that's a lot of work. Oh, and I want to show you one more. This, hmm, this picture isn't as good as another picture. During the war, as part of their recruitment efforts, they had a picture of a lady that was called, I don't know, this is kind of shiny, but I think you can see the lady on this, this side is called, they called her Rosie. And she was a picture of a woman. I'm sorry that it's kind of shiny from the glare of the light here. I don't know if I can make it different, but I think you get the idea. Maybe, they, oh, that looks a little better. There was a woman rolling up her sleeve to show you her muscle. And she was supposed to be a typical woman of America that had given up, uh, you know, some of her, she was sacrificing herself to help in the war. She has her hair pulled back with a typical kerchief or a scarf of the time and uh, some kind of overall uh, jumpsuit on. And she was working hard and developing muscle. And she got the title Rosie the Riveter because riveting was a job, one of the many factory jobs that women did. And um, I believe that the woman who first posed for that picture that has become famous, you may have even seen it already, uh, her name was Rosalind and so she became Rosie. Norman Rockwell, a famous painter, did another picture that was similar to that um, at that time. But that, the, the point was, we need help. Here's an example of how you can help. You can be like this, that kind of thing. Posters and things. We didn't have TV back then, remember. So posters and words on the radio. Selling war bonds. Letting people know that if they gave a certain amount of money to buy things like war bonds, that would help out the troops. Getting jobs saving, ra ra rationing, all these things were for the war effort. Okay, we're going to move on and talk about some other things that women did during the war. And we're going to finish up with that. Um, I think we're pretty, yeah. I will mention that the jobs that the women had at the factories, they said paid a little better than some of the jobs they had been doing, uh, the women that had been working. Some of the single women I told you were working. Um, so they paid them good for the time, but they said usually men working the same job got paid more because they still weren't ready to let women get paid well at that time, but better than they had been, and they were grateful for that job. Um, I want to talk about another way that women could help at that time, and that was in the military. Now, they couldn't go be soldiers uh, like like the men. Where's my, I have a paper. Oh, here it is. But there were other ways that they could help. There were branches of the military that they could help in. Um, the first, well, I put them in a different order, but uh, I'm going to show you them. This one, I wrote them on a piece of paper so you could see. The first one was called WAVES. You can see W-A-V-E-S. That was the name, that's the initials, the first letter of the words, Women Accepted for Voluntary Emergency Service. And they were affiliated with the Navy. And if you know anything about the Navy, that's with sailors, men that work um, on the water, in boats and ships, and uh, they're in the oceans and so forth. And they're a branch of the military that works in the water. Um, WAX was another name, sounds funny, W-A-C, and that stood for Women's Army Corps. So that was a branch of the Army that the women could get involved in. And then there was WASPs. Not the insect, but the initial W-A-S-P-S, which stands for Women Air Force Service Pilots. So there were different branches of the military, Army, Navy, and Air Force, that they could get involved in. And this was new. Um, if you wanted to be in the military, there were several jobs that you could do. Now, there were 
uh, medical jobs, which I'll talk about in a minute. But um, if you were in these other groups, you could do jobs in America and some overseas. Um, the, the waves were um, able to do some jobs that were more traditional jobs for women, like typing and, and um, uh, things like that. Desk jobs is what I'm trying to say. But others were actually machinists and uh, worked on radio as radio operators and parachute riggers and test testing things for par make parachutes work well, um, all kinds of things. And I also have a dear woman named Doris from the house I worked in that was a wave during the war. And I loved hearing her tell stories about her time in Norfolk, Virginia, at a huge naval base that's still there, and she worked there during the war. Um, in the radio department and did a lot of important work and her husband was working there as well that's how they met so it's kind of a fun story but um, that was her job there were also women that were wax like I said they were uh, women from the army that went overseas and they they could do jo jobs I can't talk today I like switchboard operators helping with telephone service clerks, typists, or driving people places in the area, um, taking photographs, and they could do something called cryptography. If you've ever heard of that, that means interpreting codes. And there were secret codes and information sent, you know, to learn about the enemy during the war. Talk about your parents about that one, because that's kind of another whole topic in itself. But they were involved in a lot of different things. And some of them did go overseas. And many of and some stayed home. And then there were the ladies that were in the WASPs, the Air Force women. And they had some important jobs and some scary ones from what I've read, is that they learned, of course, how to fly planes. And then they were involved in doing a lot of the work in America that the men that had gone to serve overseas, of course, were not available for anymore. And so they took over some of those jobs. But they were also used to train pilots for the military. Once they learned how and they were good at it, they could train men to become good pilots so that they could go overseas. They could, uh, a plane could have been made at some one of these plants that we were talking about, and they might test it, fly it around, and uh, make sure it's working and travel from one city to another city. Um, sometimes they had like a target attached to their plane, like I think flying out behind them on a banner of some sort, and they would do target practice, which sounds really dangerous. Another plane would, from the military training, would try to hit that target. Um, they would carry materials from one place to another that were important for the war. There, there were a lot of jobs that these women could do, and they were brave women. And there was the Red Cross, which is not military, but ends up helping a lot in military situations. Um, Mrs. McIntyre, Molly's mom, volunteered for the Red Cross and probably rolled up some bandages and got, helped to sell war bonds, uh, did things to help out where she could. And uh, some of those Red Cross workers were working overseas, too. Um, and so that was another important area that women could sign up for and be a part of. Now, the other thing I wanted to tell you is when we're talking about women in the military, I mentioned that some could be nurses, and, um, and some were Army nurses, and they did go overseas. I know some people that did that, too. Um, my mother was in nursing school during the war in the 1940s. She grew up on a farm in central Illinois, but she came to Chicago to go to nursing school at a hospital there. Back then, when you went to nursing school, you studied in a hospital, usually, and you went there for three years, but you didn't have your summers off. You worked all year, uh, went to school all year, and you worked in the hospital, too-ish, because you were learning and doing at the same time. And my mom went to a school just like that in Chicago. My dad, as I told you earlier, was working in Chicago, an important wartime job, and on a blind date, they were set up to be together, and that's how they met, and the rest is history. They got married, and they got married during the war, too, because they were both home, but they only had a short break before they had to get back to nursing school and the war job that my dad had. Um, I wanted to show you one thing about that. My mom was in nursing school, I have a picture of her. This is the kind of uniform they would wear back then. You can't see very well. She has a little nursing cap on. She had like a, I believe they were kind of striped, like dress underneath, 
and then that white part that you see was more like a pinafore or an apron from what I understand on top and then if you can see her legs she had black stockings and black shoes and that was a required uniform back then uh, you won't see a nurse wearing that now <laughs> um, when I went to nursing school I didn't either but um, this was the 1940s and she's standing in front of her hospital and having a picture taken um, another thing that was common during that well let me say one more thing and I'll show you something else in, in my supplies here um, during that time uh, of the war my mom was in nursing school and the reason I bring that up is because a lot of the nurses at the hospital left to go help in the war now not all of them but a chunk of them a percentage say you have a hospital of a hundred nurses now you might have more than that I'm just giving you a number okay so you have a hundred nurses and 30 of them go to help either in some place in America where they're helping with the war effort or overseas to help in military hospitals like where Dr. McIntyre Molly's dad was working and those were hard places because those were like temporary tents set up in a, a war zone to help with injured that were brought in on stretchers and in ambulances and so forth and nurses were needed definitely to help the doctors and work together and all that um, so the nurse some of the nurses uh, heeded the call and went over while well, my mom was in nursing school at a hospital so who do you think filled in for those nurses the nursing students they had extra nurses that were training they weren't done yet but they had had a lot of training and they were were ready and able to help so the, the nurses had a lot of hard work to do that were student nurses as well and that was how my mom helped out during the war she graduated in the summer of 44 about six seven eight months after she got married and then um, <clears throat> the war ended the next year um, I wanted to show you something that nurses used to wear for several several years they wore they were known by wearing this cape and my mom still had hers it was a navy blue cape if you can see on here if you were in class you could touch it and see that it's made out of wool and the, one side is navy and one side is, side is red you may have seen pictures before I have a picture I just have to find it in my pile of goodies here <laughs> oh here's a picture of an army nurse I just was going to show you before there's a army nurse corps and they're advertising you are needed now it says on the poster <laughs> um, that is a picture I have another picture um, of a nurse in um, in a cape and I don't know where it is right now but I'll send it to you in my my emails anyway I just want you to see that this is what it looked like it was this beautiful it really is pretty and it's in really excellent condition and on the collar, you would usually have where you where you were from, you know, the school you were from. She was working at Inglewood Hospital, E-H was the initials, E-H. And over here, she has S-N, and that stands for student nurse. So when she was in school and she went outside in the cold weather, she would put this cape around her, white, crispy, starched uniform. And button it up around the neck uh, there's a like a little uh, flap here here we go there's a button here and you could reach across and button it here and you can see it goes across here and that's it no sleeves it's just a cape but it was warm and maybe not as warm as a coat but it was warm and I wondered and I tried to do a little research to find out why they would wear a cape that was like traditional uniform for a nurse and a student nurse and I wondered why it was that it was a cape and not a coat and I don't know for sure I didn't find that answer but I'm thinking it's because it could be easily put on and taken off in a hurry and because they were very much needed and you know maybe they had to get to work right away so they took their coat off right away and a cape was easy to go and then throw it back on again if you need to go out so I wanted to mention that because that's that was an important job at home as well as overseas as I've mentioned before. Well, I could talk more, but you're probably tired of it. And so what I'm going to do now is to wrap up and finish. I'm going to be sending this video. I um, am going to be sending another video that's about four minutes long that is uh, about women working during the war, what we've been talking about today. 
and it's a it's a good movie and it's made more for uh, younger people um, and it's and it's really good examples it shows women at home and it shows women working I want you to look at the picture when the kids and the mom are in the kitchen and she's feeding some clothes into a ringer washer now we talked about Kirsten may have had something like that and we practiced the ringer washer when we did Kirsten you remember that when we were cranking to get the water out um, that probably came a little later than Kirsten's time but they did have it eventually but in Molly's time they were things that come along a little bit remember we said a lot of time had passed 90 years between Kirsten and Molly now they had big wash tubs with a ringer that sat on top of it. And it wasn't made out of wood. It was made out of a, uh, a metal frame, I believe, and then the rollers. Um, I'm not sure what was used for them, but a, a strong material because, you know, those rollers had to squeeze the, material, the, the wet fabric and get the water out. And you'll see that she's just kind of feeding it through. Uh, that's just a little side clip to look for that just because we've studied ringing wa ringer washers and I want you to see what kind of washer they had in the 40s. But the rest of the movie just has some, uh, just some interesting information that kind of summarizes some of the things I talked about today and shows you some of the jobs and how the women were willing to give up uh, the comfort of staying home and taking care of their children to going to work or if they were single, uh, that was a good time for them to help out. Whatever their situation, they sacrificed for the war. This was a time of sacrificing. So I'm going to be sending that video. I'm going to be sending a couple of pictures that I took that kind of explain what we've been talking about. And I'm going to be uh, sending a picture of a craft that will be a, your project for this week. And it's called Making a Mini Parachute. It is not hard at all. And you don't have to go to the store or go out of your house because you probably have every single item on this list. Now, I don't expect you to read it. I'm going to send it to you and you'll see but it's very simple use a plastic grocery bag and some thread to make a parachute parachutes uh, were very important they were used to drop soldiers into places during the war um, they were used for dropping equipment during the war excuse me they were used when you were bailing out of a plane and the plane was in was in danger of of crashing or whatever they were very important and if you didn't have a parachute, you couldn't land safely. So our project is going to be on that. And there were women that worked in making them and being a part of, of um, you know, putting them all together. Um, so that fits with this week's lesson. And the, the last thing I'm going to have you do, which is another little project that you don't even, again, you just need a piece of paper or your mom or dad or sisters or someone to write this down. But I want you to be thinking about how this time of World War II compares to now with the coronavirus. I've mentioned things from now and then in my two talks with you, but um, think of it. Uh, one of the things I'm going to give you a hint about is factories changing from making one product to now making a different product that's going to help during this time of the coronavirus. Um, I just re read um, within the last week um, it's been a little longer than that, that the GM company, which is General Motors that makes cars, is going to be making ventilators, which is a machine that helps people breathe when they're having a lot of problems. And they're very important and needed in hospitals right now, especially uh, where there's a lot of sickness. This is a way that this company is stepping up to help out. If you hear of something else like that, put that on your list and be thinking of ways that people are changing their lives right now to help out. Some people are giving blood that didn't give blood before. Um, some people are making what? Something for your face. Um, just kind of think in your head and think of what you can think of and if you do have a nice little list, share it with me. I really would appreciate feedback because I'm talking and you're not. <laughs> so let me know what's on your list, okay? That's for you and your moms and dads. I'm going to close now, and thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, always feel free to let me know. Have a good day, guys. See you later.